to uh, kneel with me, if you would, at home, if you can, and let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for the, these many reasons that our brothers and sisters have expressed um, family communication between father and son. Um, we thank you, God, that good, uh, for good health. We thank you, Lord, for um, our families being together, like my mom and my sister being together. We thank you, God, for life itself, for nature, as Shirley mentioned. And uh, we thank you, God, for um, all of the blessings um, and the needs that you supply for us, Lord. We thank you for that. We most of all thank you, as, was, as Tom mentioned, for Calvary and Jesus going, deciding to go to the cross and sacrifice uh, yourself in love and for our salvation and our forgiveness. We thank you for that, Lord. And um, Lord, we know that you are a forgiving God and we come to you confessing our sins, Lord, um, as individuals, as a church, Lord. We know our calling, we know our mission, we know our commission that you have given to us, Lord, in Matthew 28. And Lord, we need reminding of our calling to be close to you and to, to do your work, Lord, and to live the life that you live, Jesus. We need that reminder. And Lord, we uh, sometimes fall into temptations. Our arch enemy, Satan, is out there wanting to destroy us and to erase your image and your will in us. So we ask for your forgiveness, Jesus, and we thank you for your graciousness and your mercy. Lord, we bring these requests to you this morning. We know, Lord, you have told us to make our requests uh, known to you, not in order to inform you, but that we can be powerful in prayer and open to you, Lord. So we, we bring these requests to you. We pray for Maria, Lord, that her pregnancy please Jesus. We pray that her pregnancy will, will be well, um, that you will guard the health of the little baby and Maria. Um, so, Lord, we pray that you will be in that situation. Lord, we pray for my own nephew, Danny, for his health and that you will uh, heal him, Lord Jesus. We want to pray for all of our brothers and sisters in other churches, the Pico Rivera Bilingual Church, Lord. We pray for our brethren over there and all of our sister churches around the globe. Lord, we pray for um, our government leaders uh, federally and locally, that you will guide them, that your Holy Spirit will work on their consciences, and Lord, that you will help us, as I had preached last week, help us to be upright citizens, help us to uh, respect and obey the laws, um, and Lord, help us to be strong and courageous when we know that your laws take precedence. Um, Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the direction that this country is going in. We pray for other countries around the world, Lord Jesus. We know that you are a God in control of the affairs of this world. We know, Lord, from the book of Daniel, that nothing is surprising to you, that you have ordained and ordered um, the movements of mankind and you are guiding, and so help us to trust you always. Lord, we pray that you will bless our service the portion that remains, specifically, Lord, my preaching, I pray that your word will be preached by me with clarity, with all of the force of it. And Lord, I pray that everyone will be blessed with this message. I'm imperfect, Lord, and so use me for your honor and glory. And, and thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath morning. And Lord, next week when we open up our church once again, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, keep us blessed, keep us safe, and that our brothers and sisters will come together once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Uh, Chris, would you be so kind as to hand me my Bible there? Thank you so much. So open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, and I'll be getting that uh, to 
um, some passages in just a minute. I have a question for those of you who are here and those of you who are uh, out there. How many of you have treasures? How many of you have treasures? Well, maybe you never considered something you really like or are attached to as a treasure, but indeed it is. So how many of us have treasures? I can't hear you. Can you speak louder? <laughs> Chris has a treasure. What's your treasure, Chris? I'm just not thinking of the valuable things that I own, just in terms of computer, trumpets, right. phone. Tablet. Okay. The valuable things Chris says that he owns, like uh, he's, a tr he's a trumpet player, his car, uh, computer. Uh, so we all have we all have treasures, and uh, I know that you can think of some of your treasures. Some of them have uh, monetary value, others sentimental value, and and are both combined. Well, I actually brought a bag of treasures with me here today, and so I want to show you um, some of the treasures that I have here. Now, um, as a boy. One of my treasures, oh, I don't know, I was probably about uh, seven years old, six years old, eight years old. Um, one of my treasures as a boy was marbles. We used to play marbles in the dirt. Any of you guys ever play marbles, in marbles here? I remember I had those, what we called cat eye marbles and the big ones that had like little sparkles in it. That was one of my treasures. And then, um, when I was a little older, or I guess about the same age, the treasures that I had as a little boy were Hot Wheels, these little cars, Hot Wheel cars and Matchbox cars. And then uh, one Christmas I got a, I'm glad John is here because one Christmas I received the gift from my mom who was watching a Johnny Lightning racing track. And some years ago, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, it was quite a while back, I was preaching about, um, about that, that my mom got me this uh, Johnny Lightning uh, racetrack for Christmas and how I just loved it so much. And then um, I believe it was on my desk and I have it right here. So um, a little while after that, I told you I had some treasures with me. Uh, I, I think a, a week or two or maybe three weeks later, John Baker, who is sitting here, he brought me a gift. He listened to that Johnny Lightning <laughs> illustration and he brought me a gift and he actually got me a Johnny Lightning race car. And I was just, I put it in this bag here and I didn't open it, of course, um, but he got me, it's still in the original packaging, uh, Johnny Lightning, Jet Power, nothing like it in the world. And I was just so touched, and, and I still have it, John. <laughs> I was just so touched uh, that John got me this, this, this race car. And uh, it, was just, it was just amazing. It was an amazing gift. So thanks again, John. But as I got older, <clears throat> my uh, treasures changed. And so um, I'm going to bring out a couple of other treasures that I have here. And that is... Let's see, let me get to this. As I got older, namely in high school, uh, some of my treasures changed. And when I was in, in football in high school, we would have the uh, pep rally on, on uh, Friday mornings at school. The football players, we would wear our jerseys to school. And then during recess, about 15 minutes, the cheerleaders would be out there in the band and, and, uh, you know, and all of the, the cheerleaders and the drill team girls would come and they would pin things on all of the football players. Uh, there were certain drill team girls that were assigned to a football player. One year, I think I had three or four drill team girls and they would come and pin these things. And, and, I, and I kept a lot of these things. And this one, uh, my number was 68. It says here, this is a treasure for me, player of the week, Ray Navarro. And so the previous game, I was a player of the week. And then here's another one, the player of the week. <laughs> so I really, I treasured these things. And when my dad, um, who is now resting in the Lord, um, my dad actually filmed all of our football games. This one here is dated October 27, 1978. And this is a, this is a Super, 8, uh, Super 8 millimeter of color sound. And I have all of my original football games uh, on these reels that my dad had taped uh, way back then. So these are, these are treasures. These are really, really treasures for me. And then um, as I got older, of course, uh, 
you know, your treasure starts to change and you start looking at girls. And so I remember my first girlfriend, that was my treasure. I want to show you a treasure that my son had when he was a little boy. And that is this. He really, really treasured these things. Now there's about, I don't know, maybe six of these albums that we have. This is um, the Bible in living sound, 60 stories on 10 tapes. And if you open these, they're cassette tapes and they're dramatized Bible stories. Now, Chris, it's probably been a while since you've seen a cassette tape, right? <laughs> or anybody. But uh, these are in mint condition. I mean, just mint condition. And my son would listen to these. And uh, we had a little cassette player. And I would tell him stories sometimes. And, and when he got older, he would just listen to these. This was, this was his treasure. And then, of course, <clears throat> talking about my son... I want to share another treasure with you. And um, I had fun going through the boxes. This is my little son's first little shoes. <laughs> and my, my wife has saved a lot of things uh, when my son was little. And, and this, is, this is one of them. And I have something else, which is my wife's treasure. I'm just going to pull it out here. And this is Swiss chard. We have a really awesome kind of wilting because I, I picked it, but um, you know, Swiss chard, you ever eaten Swiss chard in food? Mm. Very good, very good. <laughs> My wife loves greens. We have an amazing garden at home, and I could say that the, uh, our garden is my wife's treasure. Um, she takes care of it, waters it. Um, it's amazing to eat organic things. I love it, I just absolutely love it. I treasured my little boy when, I still do, but when he was small, we would play Legos together. We would spend time together. We'd play football in the living room together. Um, there was just those times that I treasured with my, my boy when he was growing up. I have one more treasure to share with you. This one I bought in 2017, and uh, I have various Bibles at home. This one is the one that I treasure the most because, I don't know if you can zoom in, but uh, every page, every other page in this Bible is blank so that you can write your notes. So here's a text, there's a blank page. Uh, here comes Proverbs. There's the text, there's a blank page. Every one. I bought this when I was in the book of John, so if I can, I'll just show you. Here's my notes. See how I write notes in there? I journal. In fact, I even I did a map there, and I put little sticky notes. Every other page, I can put my notes. And this is a Bible that I truly, truly treasure. So I know that you have your treasures at home. When we think about treasures, we take care of them, don't we? I know, Chris, you take care of your trumpet, you take care of your computer. You don't just toss it carelessly aside. We take care of our treasures. If it's an object, we set them apart. Uh, we put, put them on the shelf in a separate place. We take special care of them, um, maybe at a deposit box at the bank, or maybe in a safe. Some of our most treasured uh, items we may keep in a safe. Now, let me ask you a question. Do our treasure, treasures change as we get older? Do our treasures change as we get older? And I would ask you why, if the answer is yes, why do they change when we get older? I would say it's because what we value, um, our perspectives, they change as we get older. Um, let me ask you this. Can a person treasure the wrong things? Can a person treasure the wrong things? I'm thinking of addictions. Some people, unfortunately, are addicted to something. Uh, or maybe even someone. Uh, addictions can be uh, a negative treasure. How about competition or power? If we treasure power and some people will do anything to gain power and influence. Um, or how about appearance or attention? Some people really, really treasure their appearance. Um, I bought a book years ago and um, this is a true story. Anne was a real teenager some time ago and uh, she was interviewed by Ariel Levy, an author, and this is what Anne said as a teenager. I remember one time 
I was at John's house with him and David, and I was looking at the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. I got in a really, really terrible mood, and I wouldn't talk because I thought Heidi Klum was just so pretty, and I was like mad. I get really upset when guys find girls really attractive because I want that attention. Unfortunately, I think that is the same story that could be repeated in thousands and thousands of young teenagers, guys or, 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 or girls. How can you find what you treasure? How can you find what you treasure? Well, I would say the time that you spend nurturing or giving attention to something, that could be your treasure. The energy and time you spend thinking about something um, or nurturing that, that is a good indicator that that's probably what your treasure is. The other thing I want to say is that uh, the things that you take care of or that you store, for example, um, a way that you can find your treasure is simply just look in the garage and look in the closet. Go to your garage, go to your closet, and look at the things that you have been saving and those times where it's time to clean up and you open those lids, uh, I, I want to keep this, and you save it year after year after year. That's a good indicator of what you save, what you keep under a cover is probably your treasure. And in fact, <clears throat> when I was grabbing some of these items uh, this morning in my garage, it is so easy to start reminiscing when you look at those old items. When I looked at my box full of high school stuff, I saw my uh, um, yearbooks there and other things, oh, and I just started thinking back. Um, but that's a good indicator of what your treasure is. Your time spent nurturing or giving attention to and the things that you take care of or that you store. But let me say this about treasures, and I don't want to get into the message. Treasures can collect dust. Treasures can collect dust. Now, even though they're valued, whether they have sentimental value to them or whether they have monetary value, the fact of the matter is many of our treasures can collect dust. And I don't mean, like I said, they're in, in protective plastic or in a, a plastic storage bin, etc. What I mean by collecting dust is that they're just there someplace and they're in storage, but they're not in use. Some of our treasures we don't use simply because of the fact that we may want this treasure to last. <clears throat> Don't think that I uh, take some of this stuff out that I just showed you. They've been in, under inside a box for years. So some treasures that we treasure may not even be in use when we're talking about objects. <clears throat> so you have your Bibles open to the book of Exodus. Um, I want to invite you to, re, uh, to go with me to Exodus chapter 19. <clears throat> Because this morning I want to talk about, and my sermon title is called, God's Treasure. God's Treasure. So look at Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse 1. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. God's Treasure. The Bible says, in the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. On that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai, where Mount Horeb was, or Mount Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped to the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. So in the third month um, after the Israelites uh, left Egypt, that life of slavery and just uh, horrible suffering and agony, um, they were happy to be free. And in the third month, they arrived there at Mount Sinai. And then in verse 3, the Bible says that Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. So Moses goes up to the mountain, God talks to him, and God gives Moses a message for all the people. Now, the people that were encamped at the, at the foot of the mountain at Mount Sinai, there must have been over a million because the Bible numbers uh, roughly 600, a little over 600,000 men that were counted, not counting the women and, and children. So um, most scholars believe there was, there was over a million, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3 million, who knows? But there were a lot of people there. 
And so God now gives Moses a message, message to tell all of these people, hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of people, that this message is for. And what does God say? Look at verse 4. <clears throat> you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. God is saying, remember, you yourselves witnessed how I saved you in miraculous ways from the, uh, from the Egyptian uh, slaveholders. Verse 5, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. Some versions say you will be, instead of my own possession, my special treasure. My special treasure. God's treasure. And in verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Let me grab my water here really quick. <coughs> so this, this is God's message to all the people. He's telling the people through Moses what God did to the Egyptians. He's asking them to remember, go back just a, a few months earlier. Remember what I did to them. So he's telling them, remember. Then he says, how I bore, you on the, uh, the, I bore all of you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. And then God, so what God is doing, first of all, is that he's sharing with them a message in those couple of verses, a message of salvation, a message of judgment. He saved them from the Egyptians, but at the same time that he was saving he was also casting judgment upon the Egyptians for what they were doing to the Israelites and also a judgment upon the Egyptians' gods. So it's salvation slash judgment. This is what God is saying. And then God is making a request to the people through Moses. He is making a request. He is saying to obey my voice. Obey my voice, God says. Listen to what I have to say. Kind of like Proverbs, the first four chapters where um, wisdom is personified and wisdom speaks, listen, listen to me, listen to me. God is saying, obey my voice. And then he says, keep my covenant. This is what he says in verse 5. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. Now these two things, God is reminding the people, this is how I saved you, this is what I did to the Egyptians. Now, because I did that, I'm asking you to do these things, obey me and keep my covenant, and if you do that, then God says, this is the result. This is the result of God's request. He says, you will be my own possession or my special treasure among all the peoples for the earth is mine. You will be my special treasure. I want to invite you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. If you have your Bibles there at home, Deuteronomy and here live. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6, and this is what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his what? Special treasure or his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now the Hebrew word for treasure, uh, possession is segula. And it's used to describe Israel as God's treasured possession eight times in the Old Testament. Eight times. This term and its cognates designate someone as a special personal possession of his God. A special personal possession of his God. That's what that word means. Um, in the Bible, its meaning shades over into beloved and singles out Israel before Yahweh. So God's special, his own possession, his special treasure, it's a something special that belongs to God. Now, this belongs to us. This is something special. These are my, my son's feet are now this big. <laughs> and this is my son's size of his feet before. This is a, this is a special possession that we have, which is why, which is why uh, we keep it uh, preserved. That's, by the way, that's 30 years old. My son is 30 years old. Um, but um, in Deuteronomy, excuse me, in Deuteronomy, 
uh, chapter 7 and chapter 14 and in later Jewish tradition, they converted this term, this treasure or possession, they converted that term from a promise to a, listen to this, a responsibility requiring the entire Jewish people, not just the priests, to live a code by a code of holiness, God's commandments, and to serve as priests, bringing knowledge of God to the world. And this is what we're going to go over in those next two verses. And by the way, um, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, that's where what? Your heart is also. This is what Jesus said many, many centuries later. Wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart is going to be. Much like our garden at home or my Bible that I, I treasure and I keep in that, in that slide box. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. That's why I said earlier, how can you figure out what your treasure is? It's what you spend a lot of time thinking about, or it's what you spend a lot of time nurturing, or, or something that you especially care for and keep under guard. Those are good indicators of what your treasure is because that's where your heart is. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. So I want to say to you this morning, God's treasure, what is God's treasure? What is his possession? It's you. It's me. God's treasure is not something to keep in a box, under a lid, in the safe, something that is immovable, something that is inanimate, God's treasure is organic, alive, a creation, a living and breathing being. And the Bible says what God is telling Moses to tell these hundreds of thousands of people. Moses is telling them, you are God's special treasure. People are God's special treasure, are God's own special possession. And here's the interesting thing that God says about his special treasure. Verse 6, we're back to Exodus chapter 19. <clears throat> and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what he says to his special treasure. You will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Moses comes down. He repeats these words to the Israelites in verses 7 and 8. And then the people respond in verse 8. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. I have a question about this. I wonder if the people, when they said to Moses, Everything that the Lord says we will do, I wonder if they actually knew the stipulations to this covenant because God uses the word covenant. Did they know all of the stipulations? Because before Exodus 19, nothing is recorded of the terms of the covenant. Absolutely zero. You have the Israelites coming out. Uh, they get to the mount. Um, you have the falling of the manna in Exodus chapter 16. But you don't have any specifics and details of the covenant. And yet the people say that they'll do everything that they do. They were willing to obey God um, even before they heard all of the details. In fact, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 because Peter actually repeats, um, repeats this concept of what we're talking about here in Exodus chapter 19. This is what the Apostle Peter says in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. This is what Peter repeats. It's the same thing that God is telling Moses in the Old Testament. You will be a covenant people to me. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Peter says that, and he says, so that you can proclaim the goodness of the Lord who brought you out of darkness into his 
marvelous light. So I have a couple of questions regarding this text, and you might be thinking to yourselves the same thing in the form of questions. What did God mean when he said a kingdom of priests? What did he mean back in Exodus 19, Exodus 19 a kingdom of priests? I ask that question because the priesthood and all of its categories and duties and in its, in, in its whole description as a ministry, it hasn't come about yet. We, ha we don't see that before Exodus 19. So what did God mean when he said a kingdom of priests? Well, let me share with you um, what priest meant for the Israelites. If you look at the word priest in the Old Testament before Exodus 19, you'll find in Genesis chapter 14, you'll find a priest of the Most High God. His name was Melchizedek. The book of Hebrews repeats this and says that Jesus was a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is only mentioned there in Genesis um, in relationship with Abraham, and it's a, he's a very, honestly, a very mysterious figure. Not much is known at all about Melchizedek, except that he was the king of Salem, Jerusalem, uh, Salem, and he was a priest of the Most High God. So um, undoubtedly, the Jews, um, unless their sojourn in Egypt and their slavery just wiped the, uh, you know, the memory of Melchizedek out of their minds. But you read about Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, but there's no more detail than that. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 45, Joseph, who ended up saving Egypt, he became the prince of Egypt, Egypt he actually married the daughter of a priest of Egypt. This priest's name was uh, Potiphar. He was the priest of On, and Joseph married his daughter um, while he was in Egypt. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter seven, uh, 47, verses 22, you, re you read about the priests of Egypt. Uh, their land was not sold. Um, during the famine, uh, 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 during the seven years of plenty, and then the seven years of famine that followed, well, during that seven years of famine, this is during the time of Joseph, a lot of the Egyptians ended up selling their land to the Pharaoh, um, except for the priests of Egypt. Um, that's what that reference is to. And then, of course, um, um, uh, Reuel, Ruel, um, otherwise known as Jethro, he goes by those two names, Ruel and Jethro. He was the priest of Midian, and Moses ended up marrying his daughter Zipporah. He was a priest of Midian. But again, there's no description of what the priestly duties were. So in general, let me say this, and I'm going to bring this home to apply to us as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So bear with me as I, as I share this with you because then I'm going to apply it to us uh, in, their, in their day in Exodus chapter 19 and in our day. Uh, priestly duties and activities, they, they varied somewhat, but primary in the early period and always basic, always basic, was the idea that a priest is a person attached to the service of God in the sanctuary. If it were false gods or if it were other gods, it was attached somehow serving God in a holy place in God's house. The original concept of the priest was as a server or a minister of God in the sanctuary, and that was analogous to that of a king's minister in the palace. So, for example, as ministers in the palace set food on the table before uh, an earthly king, early Israelite priests set holy bread on the table before God. So there's, that's what they would do. They would serve before God in his house. Um, and this was a practice that underlay the provisions for the bread of the presence. Once the Israelites built their sanctuary and there was a table of the presence or showbread. Um, and then also as ministers of a king, anybody who was in the palace ministering to the king, they served as intermediaries for citizens wishing to ask the king what course of action to take. What course of action to take or what the king's mind might be in a certain matter. So king, what are you thinking? I need to share this with the people. And so that's what a minister in the palace would do. Um, and then they would share that with the people. Early Israelite priests asked God the same sort of questions. You've heard about this Urim and the Thummim 
uh, on the priest's ephod. Then they, the priest would be a mediator between the people and God and ask God uh, same sorts of questions. Um, and it was, so he was an intermediary between God in his holy place and the people outside that a priest would communicate blessings to. In fact, here in the Tempe Church, we used to sing a song every Sabbath. After the worship service, we would hold hands. And what would, what would be that song that we would sing? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Well, that was a blessing that the priests would pronounce upon the people, a blessing from God upon the people. So this is what a priest would do. A priest would uh, generally minister to God in his house, but a priest would also minister to God in other ways as far as being an intermediary between the people and between God. So serving God close to him in sacrosanct, educating the people about what's on God's mind as a minister would educate the people, what was on the king's mind in the palace. That's what priests' general duties were. So let me bring this home. This is what God is saying to the people as they are on their way to make their new homes in Canaan. He is saying, I saved you. I rescued you. Now, because I did all of this for you, I'm going to make a request. I want you to obey my voice. I want you to listen to me. I want you to serve me. He says, because I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. What that means in their context. And what it means for us today, and this is what Peter said in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. You are God's special possession. We are God's special possession. We are his treasure. We belong to God. Therefore, you and I, we are priests. We serve God in his presence. We come to God asking what his will is. And what we do as God's people is we serve the people on planet Earth as mediators, as intermediaries, educating and helping and guiding people in this world to know what's on God's mind. To know what's on God's mind. This is what God is asking and commanding the people to do. When you go into Canaan, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to let all the Canaanites know about me. You're going to educate them. You're going to show them by decree and by life, witness, and character what's on my mind, what I'm all about. Because all they do is worship these other gods and they sacrifice their children to these gods. And there's a lot of um, uh, corrupt sexuality involved in worship of their other gods, etc. I want you to be my priests. You are going to show them what I'm all about. And isn't that true today? Isn't that true today? That's why Peter repeats this concept way in, way in the future in the New Testament. We are to be priests in this world. You are a priest of God if you belong to God, if you have connected to God and you have said, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. You are a priest in this planet. I am a priest in this planet. This is what the priestly duties were. But also what the Bible says there in verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what God's special treasure is. These people that he calls his own possession, his special treasure, they're not only priests revealing God's character to the world and what, what is on God's mind, what his will is for people. But the Bible also says that his possession, his treasure, is to be a holy nation. Now we've heard of um, statements in the Bible, both in Old and New Testament, such as, be holy because what? I am holy. This is what God says. You be holy because I am holy. It's like, it's like all of us telling our children, children, I want you to be honest because I'm honest. Children, I want you to be truthful and respect people because I'm truthful and respect people. Now, <clears throat> our children are not going to do that if they see the opposite in us, right? <clears throat> we can say certain things and actually demonstrate something completely else by our actions. So we need to be careful on that. 
But God is saying, I am your father. You're my possession. You're my kids. You're my children. I'm holy. It would only make sense that God would require of us to be holy too. Can you imagine God saying, I am holy. I'm perfect. Um, I'm compassionate. I'm loving. I'm truthful, uh, etc., etc. But if you want to lie sometimes, if you want to cheat sometimes, if you want to be unfaithful sometimes, if you want to be angry and vengeful and vindictive and bitter sometimes, um, if you don't want to tell the truth but you want to gossip sometimes, I understand what life is like on planet Earth. It's not perfect. Uh, my son was there, so I get it. Um, if you don't want to be completely honest and truthful and holy, and you want to kind of ride the fence sometimes, and in fact, even jump on the other side of the fence and see what it's like to live a worldly lifestyle. I understand. That's okay. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let you do that sometimes. Just don't go overboard, but I'll let you do that. So, can you imagine God talking like that? Of course not. God says, I'm holy. I want you to be the same as my special treasure, as my special possession. I want you to reflect what I am like and what I'm about. Deuteronomy chapter 26, <clears throat> I, want you to invite you, uh, I want to invite you to open your Bibles there. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Okay, it's like three books after Exodus. So you go forward, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So three books after Exodus to your right. Exodus chapter 26, and I want to start reading verse 16. Verse 16. And the Bible says this, This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and ordinances. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. In fact, I believe it was Isaiah that said, um, God was saying to his people, this is many, many centuries later, God was saying through the prophet Isaiah, you people only worship me through rote. And I think that's the problem with a lot of our worship and obedience and followership of God today. We're just going through the motions. It's just through rote. What God is saying here in verse 16, with all your heart and with all your soul, it's got to be right here. It's got to be with the heart. Not just by rote, not just by memory, not just going through the motions, because everybody else does it this way, and so I do it. No, it's got to be with the heart. Verse 17, you have today declared the Lord to be your God and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes. He's saying, you decided to walk with God. You decided to keep his, his, his statutes, his commandments, and his ordinances and listen to his voice. The Lord has today declared you to be his people, a treasured possession as he promised you and that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high. I love this verse. This is verse 19. And that he will set you high above all nations which he has made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you, are, you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. A consecrated people to God as he has spoken. Be holy because I am holy. In fact, the New Testament, again, repeats this concept. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 and 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Coincidentally, they, they have the same chapter and the same verse. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. And 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Colossians, this is the New Testament. It says here, Colossians, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you receive Jesus, as I have received Jesus, we are to walk in him. And then John says, that was the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle John says basically the same thing. 1 John 2 verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Be holy as I'm holy. Walk as I walk. Talk as I talk. Act as I act. It's Follow the leader. We've all played that game when we were kids. 
there's a leader and you jump on the chair and you jump over here and you hop, skip and jump and run over here and you go around this tree. We've all played follow the leader before, right? Or leapfrog, etc. You follow the leader. This is the concept that is equal in throughout the Old Testament and, and flows over like flowing, like a flowing river into the New Testament. Walk as I walk, God says. Be holy because I'm holy. You believe in me? Then act like you believe in me. Live like you believe in me. And these are what both apostles are saying, both Paul and John. If you believe in Jesus, then walk in Jesus. Walk like he walked. Be holy as God is holy. This is God's special treasure. It's you, my friend. It's me. You are God's treasure. You are his possession. And because God has saved us, and he has done marvelous things in our lives and continues to do so, he is asking you with open arms and with love, obey my voice, be a kingdom of priests in this world, and walk holy, live in holiness. What is God's treasure? It's his people, those who have made a covenant relationship with him to follow him, to love him, and to obey him. In concluding this morning, God's people, as I said, are called to be priests. In other words, to make known who God is in the world. Not only through our words and through Bible studies and, and posting things on Facebook, good Bible things on Facebook, but it's through our character witness. If God were to take away your sight, and if God were to take away your vocal cords, and if God were to take away your hearing so that your words are taken away, everything is taken away, then the only thing that people would go on by who you are is how you act. They couldn't go by your words. They couldn't go by what you are looking at. The only thing they can go by is who you are as a person. I'm wondering if sometimes it would be a blessing if God were to take away our eyes and our voice or something, because how are we using, as the Apostle Paul says, do not use the members of your body in acts of sin. That's what he says in the book of Galatians and in the book of Romans. But God's people are called to be priests, make known whose God is in the world, and God's people are called to be partakers of his divine nature. In other words, to walk in the holiness of to walk circumspect lives. In fact, Peter says that in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says, through these glorious and great promises of God, we can actually be partakers of his divine nature. Not becoming divine ourselves, but assimilating those divine attributes in our character. Unlike treasures we may have at home, in the garage, or in the safe, or in the closet, in a bank, where these treasures indeed have value, but they just sit in the dark, God's treasure is a living treasure. You and I, we're alive. That's what his treasure is. And unlike treasures, we may have that, uh, unlike treasures, we may have that, uh, they may change because of our changing outlooks and what we deem as important. God's treasure has never changed. He has never changed what he values as most important and crucial, and that's people. He doesn't, with the passing of thousands of years, God doesn't change his mind. You know, I've matured a little bit now. Now, you know, I don't keep certain things as my treasured possession. I, I think I'm developing and I'm moving on to bigger and better things. That's not God. This treasure has always been the same. It's been people. And the thing I like about God's treasure, his possession, people, live people, you and me, is that he wants to spend time with his treasure. Does he not? He doesn't just create a treasure and leave it on its own. That's why the Bible says it's like a golden thread throughout Scripture. Way back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, the Bible says in the book of Genesis. And then in the book of Exodus, where we're at, in chapter 25, verse 8, God says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God is 
It's his noble obsession to be with his possession, to be with his treasure. I want to be with him. And then, of course, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, And I will be their God, and I will dwell with them, and them with me. There will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It is God's noble obsession to be with his treasured possession all throughout Scripture. God treasures you. God treasures me. God treasures us. And when God calls people through his spirit in our consciences, that soft wooing of God's voice, he will not only treasure us always, but he has an immense treasure stored up for those that belong to God, and it is beyond anything, beyond our wildest imagination. 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, 1 verses 3 and 4 says this blessed be the God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you reserved in heaven for you he's got we're his treasure but he's got amazing treasures in store for us we are god's treasure so won't you respond to him to his call to his blessing and his challenge for you to live a life for him a life that means salvation a life that means fulfillment a life that means truth a life that means peace and immortality in a perfect, beautiful world. I want to make that invitation to you. If you have your treasures at home, whatever they look like, I want you to tell yourself, remind yourself, you, your being, you are God's treasure. You are a special possession. And he is calling you to be his, to walk like he walked to dedicate your heart and your mind and your soul to him. I want to make that invitation. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You'll never regret it. Jesus will come into your heart. He will replace those feelings of guilt and shame. He can replace it with peace and forgiveness. Instead of an empty vacuum feeling in your heart that you don't know what your life is about, Jesus will give you that fulfillment and show you this is what life is really about. You'll have a sense of purpose, a sense of direction in life if only you invite Jesus in your heart today. I want to invite you to invite Jesus in your heart. You're his own special possession. Unfortunately, many will say no to God, will say no to Jesus. And there will be a judgment day. It's not that God wants people to be lost. He's interested in populating heaven. God is interested in numbers and he is interested in you because you are his personal treasured possession. Accept him. Accept his call. See his hands reaching out to you. I want to make that invitation to you today. And for those of you who are here present, I know that you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. I want to extend the invitation to us here to say to God this morning, God, I always want to be your treasured possession. I want to be yours forever and ever and ever. If that's your wish, I invite you to stand up at this moment. And I invite you to stand up where you are at home. If you have accepted this invitation, wherever you are, I want you to stand up and I want you to pray with me at this moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much because we know what God's treasure is. We've discovered it this morning. It is people, regardless of race, regardless of culture, of skin color, of language, of dialect, of gender. People, people, God, are your special treasure. God, 
I want to pray for those who have accepted this invitation to be your special treasure. I pray, Jesus, that you will forgive us of our sins. We are all in the same boat in this. We're all sinners, and we need a Savior. And Jesus, I pray that you will forgive those who are listening, who have their heads bowed. Some of them are crying right now and feeling your Holy Spirit working on their hearts, wooing them to repentance and to ask forgiveness. And Lord, I know that it is your love that brings us to repentance. It's not your threats. It's not the threats of a hell. It's not the threats of a punishment. It is your love and kindness that touches our hearts. I know hearts are being touched right now as I speak, Jesus. So minister to them. Tell them how special they are to you. Tell us how special of a treasure we are to you, God. Thank you so much. Help us, God, to be your priests and a holy nation in this world. <clears throat> Especially now, God, where people may be thinking strange thoughts about you because of this pandemic. Especially now when people are stressed out and maybe don't have a sense of direction or peace. May we be your special possession as priests and a holy nation in this world. Minister to those who have just accept, accepted you, God. Touch their hearts. Live in their hearts. And direct their lives from here on forward. It's not easy, God. Christianity is not for cowards. But we know that you give us power and strength to resist our arch enemy and our natural tendencies to go towards what is wrong. Give us those people, give us that strength, give us your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord, as Numbers chapter 6 says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. You are God's special possession and his treasure. Don't forget it. Next week, we will continue our live streaming, but we will be here live. I'm going to invite, in fact, next week, Robert, just scan the crowd. We have no idea how many people will be here next week in our sanctuary, but just keep that in mind. We will be reopening next Sabbath on May 30. May the Lord bless you and keep you and have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath.